You're listening to Heritage Radio Network. With more than 30 weekly podcasts, HRN has something for every food lover. Learn more at heritageradionetwork.org. This episode is brought to you by Wisconsin Cheese. We've been making cheese in Wisconsin since before we were even a state, which may be one reason why we win so many awards for it. It's what happens when a whole state dreams in cheese. Find your next favorite cheese at wisconsincheese.com. The pop from a bottle of Snapple, a hiss from a soda stream, the scream of a tea kettle. Those are just a few of the found sounds that HRN engineer Armin Spengen, aka Armin Hammer, worked into that track that you just heard. Pressure is inescapable, especially in the kitchen. It breaks down our beans, keeps our spritzes spritzy, and extracts our espresso. Pressure can also break down our spirits, and kitchens have a reputation for being exceptionally stressful scenes. This week, we're investigating pressure in a variety of contexts, from ubiquitous appliances to non-indigenous species. I'm Matt Patterson, and this is Meat and Three on HRN. Meat and Three. Meat and Three. Meat and Three. One meat, three sides. Food, news, and storytelling. A square meal for your ears. Meat and three. So I've never been in a Michelin star kitchen during service, but having consumed a lot of food media, here's what I imagine. You feel a kind of kinetic energy radiating as chefs in white coats move in a sort of organized chaos working in perfect precision and echoing shouts of yes chef as they plate identical dishes over and over and over again. Maybe they're using tweezers? One can't help but wonder, when perfection is the expectation, what does it feel like to be the chef charged with preparing the immaculately plated dish? In this story, Rana Rudy speaks to three chefs with Michelin star backgrounds to understand the delicacy of pressure in a Michelin star kitchen and how it can create something magnificent and destructive at the same time. What does it feel like to be behind the plate that is expected to bring gasps of awe to each guest every night? What does it feel like to carry the pressure of perfection every day? You kind of start to feel like a machine. Food can be something so beautiful, so thoughtful, where you spend a lot of time coming up with something. But in a fine dining restaurant where you have to uphold stars or you have to expect to feed maybe a restaurant critic, it's really hard not to feel like a failure when you have messed something up and you almost don't even feel human after an evening of service because you've just had to keep going. You don't, you don't have a choice but to keep going. Genevieve Yam is the former pastry cook at two Michelin-starred Blue Hill and former pastry chef de partie at three Michelin-starred Per Se. What is it that we're even working towards? What is this pinnacle that we're all trying to reach? I don't know what it is. I'm not sure many chefs know either. But I think for a lot of people who've cooked their entire life, cooking is the only thing they know. Working in a restaurant is the only thing they know. And their identity is so tied to being a chef. And so if you are not a chef who wins your Michelin stars, then Who are you? How have these three stars taken such a hold on the restaurant industry? What is it about them that pushes chefs to such extremes? And where did this system come from? The origin story of this prestigious system may catch you by surprise. 
What is now revered by some to be the Bible of Dining Guides started in humble origins as a marketing strategy by the brothers André and Edouard Michelin to sell more of their Michelin tires. In 1889, in a small French town, they put together a simple guide of fuel and rest stops to incentivize car owners to travel more and thereby boost the sale of their tires. Almost two decades later, the guide grew to what it is today, with a system of awarding restaurants one, two, or three stars. Each star still honors the origin story, one star being worth a stop, two stars are worth a detour, and three stars are worth a special journey. All travel ideally made in your car sporting Michelin tires. So, what does it take to be worthy of Michelin's guide? Short answer, no one really knows. According to the Michelin Guide website, the following five metrics are used to determine a restaurant's stars. Using quality products, mastery of flavor and cooking techniques, personality of the chef in the cuisine, value for money, and consistency of food. Aside from this, the mystery around the system and the elusiveness of the inspectors drives chefs and restaurant owners to push for perfection in every aspect of their dining experience. Being at the three Michelin star level means upholding the best of everything. It goes down to the temperature of your butter when it goes out into the dining room. You really think of every single detail. And so I think there's a lot of anxiety around, did I do that right? Or is there anything else that we can do? This pressure and constant drive toward perfection has been known to make people crack. It famously drove chef Marco Pierre White, the youngest chef to ever receive three Michelin stars, to quote-unquote return these accolades and retire from his restaurant. Many chefs have followed suit with this practice of returning their restaurant's awarded stars, wanting to be free from the pressure and to be able to create without the worry of maintaining Michelin standards. So what is sacrificed in this pursuit of perfection, and are there dangers of losing one's identity in the process? I asked Genevieve what this pursuit looked like on a daily basis. I think the thing with perfection is you have to do something over and over and over again until you nail it. I remember having to pipe and fill hundreds of macarons each day. And if they were not perfect, if they had squished just a little bit too much, if I had put a little bit too much filling or not enough filling, that was not a macaron that was good enough to be served. And if it wasn't perfect, then why were you serving it? After I left the restaurant industry, I have definitely had to go through a lot of therapy to help come to terms with the fact that not everything in my life has to be perfect all the time. (laughs) But that is just one side of the story. Pressure can also help to create something beautiful. I spoke with two chefs at Michelin-starred restaurants in San Francisco to understand the way that they manage pressure in their kitchens. Nick Valono is the chef de cuisine at Atelier Cren, Dominique Cren's three Michelin-starred restaurants serving whimsical and elegant French cuisine. I think teaching and and mentoring is so important. And I think there's two ways to go to manage in this environment. And it's either to be out of fear or out of instilling that same like responsibility in your, in your employees and making them feel the pressure of course, but in a way that's, that's wanting to push further and not just like pressure of, am I going to get, something thrown at me today or is someone going to yell at me or am I going to lose my job? It, it's terrible to, to just be an asshole to people all day. I've been in the environment where that's what's been asked of me and it's mentally draining, it's physically draining and it doesn't work anymore. We, it, it, I mean, you can talk to anyone in the industry, you see it, whether it's this person getting called out for you know, violence or harassment or all these things and, and it, it absolutely doesn't work. Gabby Maeda is the executive chef at Statebird Provisions, a colorful and vibrant restaurant serving dim sum style American dishes. She spoke to me about leading with positive pressure and empowering her chefs through visibility, trust, and encouragement. If I see something that, that's not correct, absolutely is going to get acknowledged, but it doesn't have to be in a screaming way. 
I, nothing makes me happier than one of the members of my team coming up to me with like, hey, I messed this up. Because they feel that they can. And that pressure, there's so many cooks that would hide that from a chef, that would hide and take a shortcut so their chef doesn't find out. And that to me doesn't do anything for the food. It doesn't do anything for them. They're never gonna learn how to take ownership. They're gonna always hide. And there's just a different, I think it's just a different perspective of pressure. This different perspective of pressure is pivotal in a Michelin star kitchen when everything seems to ride on the consequences of imperfection. In such a competitive space, it can be easy for a culture of bullying to enforce results and easy for one's identity to be lost in the process, being reduced to a machine of perfect precision. Both Nick and Gabby's styles of leading with compassion and encouragement instead of with fear showcase a refreshing perspective in a cutthroat industry. I think when my team feels extremely good about going into their day, going into service, and feeling like they worked really hard but not defeated, to me that's success of a day. And that we're excited to do it again tomorrow. We had a day recently where it was really, really crazy. And we had the best time because we're doing it together, because we were able to, to cook and to communicate clearly and, you know, we all realized, and I looked around, and everyone around me is the same. They love what they do. And how amazing is it to be around like-minded people? And to do that and replicate that every single day is kind of the goals. The key to their success? Replication of more than just that perfect plate. Let's leave the kitchen for a moment and consider a larger scale. What about pressure on entire ecosystems? Stella Maiden investigates the pressure that invasive species can exert on their new homes, and whether eating those intruders could solve the situation or make it worse. In the United States, there are over 6,500 non-indigenous species. Although non-indigenous species can be integrated into food production and consumption in a sustainable manner, those that are classified as invasive pose a threat to native plants and animals, as well as the economy and environment which they inhabit. According to the National Wildlife Federation, 42% of threatened or endangered species are at risk due to invasives, and they have cost the U.S. billions of dollars each year. So what can the average person do to stop this? Some state governments encourage citizens to kill invasives on site, such as the spotted lanternfly, which spread across the East Coast beginning in 2014. But what about a more enjoyable way to bite back? I spoke with three experts about the rather controversial topic of eating invasives. Joe Roman is a conservation biologist and researcher at the University of Vermont, who also runs the website Eat the Invaders. Around two decades ago, he coined the term invasivorism, which refers to eating invasive species as a means to control or eliminate their numbers. However, as Joe explains, eating invasives should not be the first resort. The last thing you want to do is eating invaders. The most important thing you want to do is prevent new invasions, right? So we want strong policies that restrict the, in, the arrival of new species, because we'll never win if we keep bringing new species in, right? So the way we've changed it is to really emphasize the educational aspect of this. This is not the answer to invasive species. This is one way to reach a new audience and have fun with it, that people can go out and learn about the environmental, the ecological history of their area, as well as have a good meal. Um, but but it isn't just intent. It certainly isn't intended to be a commercial venture or something where I think this is going to solve the problem. It's one tool in the toolkit. Next, I spoke with Martin Nunez, a professor of biology and biochemistry at the University of Houston. Martin was against eating invasives at first, but now sees the movement as a great tool for environmental outreach. Still, he remains wary of the potential for the popularization of invasivore diets to negatively influence food culture. The problem with eating invasives is that we we maybe like making like a, like a new market for something that wasn't before. So if we if we create like a, like say like a new market for like a new species, 
people perhaps will want to keep it, no, or or even like spread it. So that's a problem of of eating like invasives. Although eating invasives may be counterproductive in the long term, there have been success stories. Take, for example, the lionfish. The lionfish is a species native to the Indo-Pacific that is spread to the Atlantic, Gulf of Mexico, and Caribbean. They negatively impact ecosystems by preying on native aquatic species and removing populations that consume algae, which, when overgrown, can harm coral reefs. Studies have shown that fishing pressure on lionfish have reduced their numbers and resulted in increased native fish populations. So how does one go about eating invasives? Nowadays, there are a variety of food establishments that provide meals with invasives on the menu. But for those who would like to forage for themselves, Tama Matsuoka Wong, a practitioner and forager, has a set of guidelines she uses for her harvesting company, Meadows and More, which she encourages the public to employ as well. In terms of sustainability and the plant population, you really don't have to worry. I think that's great about invasive species. You don't have to worry about taking them because there's just like too much already, right? So let's say you want to take these invasive species and you're like, yeah, I found out what they are. I know that they're edible. So then the the second part is about the control. So you want to be careful about when and how you're harvesting. So number one, make sure you have permission, you're working with the property owners because in some places, in parks, et cetera, it's illegal. And part of the reason it's illegal is because they're going out and spraying the stuff with serious poisons. And then secondly, you want to make sure that you're harvesting them in a way that is not invigorating the plant. You have to be very careful if where you dispose of it. So let's say I'm taking parts of it and then other parts, which you're not sure, you know, whether it might end up seeding or you want to make sure that you're, I have an invasive plant area that I we dispose and so we can keep it's really close to where we process things so we can keep an eye on it and make sure that nothing's coming out of that. You know, in terms of a basic framework for invasive plants, I think as long as you are following these um, governance, it's a good thing. Eating invasives has its risks and limits, but it can be a great way to spread awareness and interact with the environment. Just remember the next time you're enjoying a nice plate of lionfish that all good things must come to an end. We'll be right back with more Meat and 3 after a brief break. This episode is brought to you by Wisconsin Cheese. There's a reason when you think of Wisconsin, you think cheese. Cheese is a huge part of Wisconsin's history and future. In Wisconsin, the state of cheese, the tradition of cheesemaking excellence began 180 years ago, before Wisconsin was recognized as a state. Immigrants traveled to settle in this lush green hills of Wisconsin, bringing their cheesemaking traditions with them. These storied skills combined with the freshest milk available created a cheesemaking culture that is uniquely Wisconsin. Wisconsin's 1,200 cheesemakers, many of whom are third and fourth generation, continue to pass on old world traditions while adopting modern innovations in cheesemaking craftsmanship. Find your next favorite cheese at wisconsincheese.com. Welcome back to Meat and 3. There's nothing more synonymous with pressure in the kitchen than the pressure cooker. Next up, Videhi Kudiati explores the evolution of the pressure cooker as an essential tool for some diasporic communities. In the 17th century, French physicist Denis Pepin created a kitchen appliance that changed the way food was cooked in everyday households. Papa's new digester for softening bones created quite a stir in London's Royal Society as it introduced a new way of cooking, by using steam. Papa's device cooked meat more efficiently and thoroughly, owing its success to the use of steam. Papa's invention was both a culinary and scientific breakthrough. Over the next few centuries, 
The device evolved and eventually became a kitchen staple in the 1950s and 60s. And today, the pressure cooker has traveled across continents and oceans to become a vessel for culture and family history, especially within the South Asian diaspora. The device has a special place in South Asian kitchens. Not only is it a key protagonist in the cooking of staple foods such as dals, biryanis and pulaos, it is also a symbol of childhood nostalgia for many. For me, the loud hissing of the pressure cooker is emblematic of Sunday mornings at home and my mother's cooking. For others, it carries memories of kitchen mishaps that occurred when the device wasn't used properly. Despite the centrality of the pressure cooker in South Asian and diaspora communities, newer and more convenient appliances have replaced the traditional cooker. One such device is the Instant Pot. The modern, electric, and safer version of the pressure cooker has quickly pervaded Asian communities in the US and proven its usefulness in South Asian cooking. I have a relative, a distant cousin who is married to a woman who um, has kind of really thrown herself into this act of reconstructing the dishes of her childhood. Um, she she was born in India and raised there and only came to the U.S. for marriage when she married this relative of mine. And she um, they have two kids and they're kind of creating a family and a home. And she had discovered the Instant Pot. And she, I think I referred to her in the piece as patient zero. So she was just kind of throwing herself into this culture. She was a member of a Facebook group, an Instant Pop Facebook group. And she convinced my first cousin's wife, Asha, to buy an Instant Pot. And then, and now I think they might each have two in their homes. That was writer Malika Rao talking about her own experience with the Instant Pot phenomenon. The rise of the Instant Pot among Malika's community is emblematic of the slow demise of the pressure cooker in diasporic households. The Instant Pot is a device that imitates the basic functions of a pressure cooker while staying true to its convenience and accessibility. In other words, consumers can make the same food in an Instant Pot that they made in the lofty pressure cooker. In many modern South Asian households, the convenience of the Instant Pot has outweighed the nostalgia associated with the traditional pressure cooker. Yeah, I mean, I think, yeah, you could imagine a world where people held on to the pressure cooker because it has all these um, nostalgic associations. But I think people are also practical, right? I mean, if you left a place to to go somewhere else, you're you're probably uh, in not not particularly hidebound. Despite the practicality of the instant pot in comparison to the pressure cooker, members of the South Asian diaspora, such as myself, still cling on to our beloved kitchen appliance. I asked Malika why this is such a common occurrence. It's funny. It seems like sort of a, in some ways, it's kind of a testament to human irrationality and sentimentality because, I mean, first of all, the pressure cooker is not an Indian invention. It was was a European invention. It was invented by a British guy and it really gained popularity in Europe first. Um, and, and so, you know, to begin with, it's kind of, it's, it's not endemic. Right. And so I think there's maybe just a, people are very slow to, to change in some ways. And there are these totems that can seem so, so vital in terms of defining who we are. But again, you know, I mean, uh, so many so-called staples of the Indian diet are also new world ingredients. They didn't have them until, until Columbus came to America. So, um, have access to them. So, yeah. So I think there's obviously a kind of artificial aspect to all of this kind of culture making where you might, people might think that they're being, they're, they're staying true to some kind of larger tradition when in fact they're just staying true to what they know from their childhood. And that seems to make sense. While the Instant Pot may have replaced the traditional pressure cooker in the kitchen, the sentimentality and nostalgia associated with the older device doesn't seem to be going anywhere. For our last story, we tune into HRN's Agave Road Trip, which endeavors to demystify the world of agave spirits. 
In the first season of their show, hosts Lou Bank and Chava Peribon lay out the process of Mezcal production step by step. So we previously talked about what agave is and how you harvest it. And then we talked about roasting the agave. And now we're talking about once you've roasted it, what do you do with it? Well, you have to find a way of making it. Like, how would you describe the consistency that it has? It's like smashed potatoes, sort of. They go on to explain that while many mezcaleros use modern equipment, some believe old school manual pressure is preferable to the more mechanized options for breaking down agave. In an interview with mezcal producer Lalo Angeles, he explains why he made the switch from a wood chipper type machine to the more traditional wooden mallet. When we mill agave by hand, it's like when we make guacamole. When we place the avocado in the mold cajete and crush it with a stone, or even using a mortar, we introduce a lot of new flavors. But if you take the same avocado and put it inside a blender, it becomes more rigid. It does taste like avocado, but nothing else. I talk about guacamole because I think it is a very universal thing. And I realized that the same thing happened with agave. When milling it with a machine, all the flavors become very clear, very defined. A tobasiche was only a tobasiche, and it didn't have any more flavors around it. Tobasiche is a wild subspecies of agave. When you mill it by hand, you introduce more aromas. The mezcal smells like tobasiche too, but it also smells like flowers, earth, and many other things. Milling the agave mechanically is most efficient. It makes a higher yield of the sugars available to the yeast to create alcohol. Using a modern wood chipper type machine might speed along the process, but it may also lose unique flavors that reflect the specific agave varieties and growing regions. The decision of how exactly to process the agave isn't necessarily in the hands of mescaleros. Global demand of mezcal and tequila has risen sharply over the last few decades. In an upcoming trilogy of episodes focused on sustainability in the mezcal industry, Lou and Chava discuss the impact of this consumer demand on an ecosystem and economy that revolves around a plant which can take up to 40 years to mature. In essence, we're turning, we're turning Oaxaca into the same kind of monoculture with Espadine that Jalisco has become with Blue Weber. So if yeah. you just look at a bottle and see, okay, hey, look at this. It's from Guanajuato, and it's, it's made from Salmiana. Drink it, right? Like right now, like the last time I checked the numbers, something like 90% of all mezcal was made from Espadine hey, wow. in Oaxaca, which means that basically one out of every 10 times the average consumer is making a choice. The choice is something that's not Espadine, not Oaxaca. Hey, just do that two yeah. out of 10 I mean, times, I, three I like out of how, 10 times. Well, I really like how simple that formula is. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I'm going to give you a compliment. Won't happen again during these three episodes. So I like the, <laughs> the simplicity of that formula also because you are sending money to other areas of Mexico. Yeah. Which again, I think that, uh, yeah, like that's a twofold thing. Mm-hmm. You are giving more, uh, you're distributing the, pressure on the land Mm -hmm. in more square kilometers Mm -hmm. and you are also giving more communities more families resources in order to take better care of their lands because honestly something that i've learned in mexico Mm -hmm. is people don't want to leave their towns sure they don't want to go live in mexico city in la condesa right freak no they want to stay where they have their family their roots their the mango that they like Mm -hmm. the parties that that they enjoy their saints Mm -hmm. and they are actually extremely good at taking very good care of their land if they have the means and uh and and the mind uh, the 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 main the, the sanity or the i don't know like just the resources in order to do that the more resources you give to to the people that are starting to to see an agave a valuable resource, mm-hmm. the better they might take care of of their land until it gets to a certain size. Decisions about what type of agave to grow and how to process it should stay in the hands of the mezcaleros. And Mezcal's global following ought to shine a proper spotlight on the diversity of the artisans dedicated to the craft. 
If you want to learn more about supporting these communities, striving to share a taste of their land with the world, subscribe to Agave Road Trip. That link, plus many more for each of our stories, can be found in our show notes. That's our show. Special thanks this week to Rana Rudy, Stella Maiden, Vaidehi Kudiati, and Taylor Early. Meet and Three is produced by Kevin Chang Barnum, Katie Mosman Wadler, and me, Matt Patterson. Our audio engineer for this episode is Kevin Chang Barnum. Our theme song was composed by Breakmaster Cylinder. This program is supported in part by public funds from the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs in partnership with the City Council. Meet and 3 is powered by Simplecast. Meet and 3 is a production of Heritage Radio Network, the world's pioneer food radio station. Learn more at heritageradionetwork.org and follow us at heritage underscore radio. And please stay in touch. Whether you have a story idea or would just like to say hey, write us at ideas at meetn3.nyc. That's all spelled out. <laughs>